<laughs> Welcome to SAG Aftrus Foundations, the business program. I'm Tanana Ribdu, a writer, producer, and lecturer in the African American Studies Department at UCLA. Before we are joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible by the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are SAG-AFTRA and, you, and you're an artist who needs help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, it is my thrill, not just my pleasure, to introduce today's panelists, Tony Todd, Nicole Bahari, Rusty Cundiff, Melody Cooper, and Wynne Rosenfeld. So uh, thank. Uh, so let's start with introductions really briefly. Tony Todd is literally a living legend, best known for his unforgettable performance in the original Candyman. Tony Todd is an actor on stage and screen. I first saw him as August Wilson's guest in the lead role in King Hedley II at the Seattle Repertory Theater in 2003, magical. And Wait, he's, you saw that? That's amazing. I was there. I knew that. Okay. Too shy to introduce myself. Steve and I were in the audience. <laughs> That's awesome. He's an unforgettable, um, he's in an unforgettable uh, applause moment in Nia DaCosta's new Candyman and has appeared in too many horror films to name, including 1990s, Remake of Night of the Living Dead, Rusty Cundiff's recent Tales from the Hood 3, and I'm especially thrilled that he appeared in an upcoming segment in Shudder's new Black horror anthology film, Horror Noir, in the episode Fugue State that I co-wrote with my collaborator and husband, Stephen Barnes. Nicole Bahari, one of my favorite actresses and humans, cast her in everything, whoever is listening. She elevates every project she touches. She's my avatar and the female lead for every script I write. <laughs> Trained at Juilliard. Bahari was in the Jackie Robinson biopic 42, American Violet, Little Fires Everywhere, starred as Abby Mills on Sleepy Hollow, episode of Black Mirror that went viral, just a moment from her performance went viral on Twitter and had a breakout performance in last year's Miss Juneteenth for which she won a Gotham Award for Best Actress, currently in Scenes from a Marriage on HBO. Rusty Cundiff. In terms of horror, Cundiff is best known for his Tales from the Hood film series, which debuted in the horror renaissance of the 1990s, but recently has spawned Tales 2 and 3. Tales from the Hood is significant in Black horror history for its depiction of racism as the monster and Black vengeance horror. Also, one film on repeat in my house is Fear of a Black Hat, his brilliant mockumentary spoofing the world of 1990s hip hop. He also directed three seasons of Chappelle show. He's worked with Wanda Sykes as well as other film and TV projects. And now he's working on a documentary about a life-changing youth program in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome. Wynn Rosenfeld is a writer, producer, and president of my favorite production company, Jordan Peele's Monkey Paw. He oversees the company's diverse slate of film and television products, uh, pr productions. He, he oversees the company's diverse slate of film and television productions and is executive producer of Lovecraft Country, The Twilight Zone, Hunters. He's a producer on Monkey Paw's latest feature film, Candyman, for which he also co-wrote the screenplay along with Jordan Peele and the film's director, Nia DaCosta. Prior to joining the company, Wynn produced digital, social, and broadcast content for various outlets, including NBC, Slate, and NPR, and edited an Emmy Award-winning segment at PBS. And also, we have Melody Cooper, who represents the next generation of horror creators. After George Floyd's murder, she was on a Juneteenth panel for the Writers Guild with Black showrunners and Color of Change, which called for more Black writers on cop shows to bring authenticity about police in the Black community. Subsequent to that, she was asked to join the 22nd season of NBC Universal's Law and Order SVU as a story editor to work with showrunner Warren Light. She started out in TV in 2019 as a staff writer on the second season of the CW Network's Two Sentence Horror Stories, which focuses on social issues and women and marginalized storytelling and horror. She's also written many scripts herself, shorts, features um, that are in the pipeline. 
and several writing competitions. Welcome to everybody. I could not be more excited to be doing this panel with all of you. As I said, you're all some of my favorite people, absolutely. So I'm gonna start with a general question. Since we've all touched the horror space, what is your relationship with horror as a genre? How did you get interested in it? And what was the first film or TV show that scared the hell out of you? That's for everybody. I, I, for me, I think it was just the luck of the draw. I mean, um, you know, like the rest of this esteemed panel, I was trained. I went to Trinity Rep Conservatory. And, you know, when you're the only Black artist in a, in a, in a conservatory program, you, you, you're forced to do all the classics. So I was trained with Miss Julie Strindberg, et cetera. I did not wake up in high school and say, I want to be a horror star or an actor. I just wanted to be an actor. And... Um, and, and for the most part, I think I've achieved that. You know, it, it's always, it's weird being the only one at an esteemed program, you know, and to say, you got to pick and choose your projects. You got to learn how to work with others. You have to also figure out how to make, be your best, you know, on, as, as, as you progress along the growing tree or the learning tree. Who else wants to jump in there? How did you come to love horror? What, what, um, okay, for me, it was a combination of Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, and a made-for-TV movie called Trilogy of Terror uh, with Karen Black with this little doll. And, and the Night Gallery episode with Ossie Davis, um, and I think it was Roddy McDowell, and then the, the uh, uh, Trilogy of Terror with Karen Black, both of those things informed one of the... One of the uh, one of the bits we did in the first Tales from the Hood with the dolls and the pictures and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, for me, it was my, my, uh, my mother is an English teacher and she read lots of horror. So I remember her reading Stephen King and seeing the covers and thinking, I have got to read that. And my, my parents weren't the kind of parents that kept kids away from really scary, inappropriate films. So, so I grew up watching all the things you shouldn't watch from classic horror. Um, I, I remember when they said, oh, you've got to see this film, Night of the Living Dead. And it, I remember seeing The Exorcist when I was young. I, I saw all these films at a young age and it didn't seem abnormal to me. Uh, it, it was thrilling. It was thrilling to see, um, first of all, like Night of the Living Dead was a black actor, had a black actor. Um, the Exorcist was dealing with women in key roles. So I was, I was even from those early films that in those classics they exposed me to, uh, I was, I was getting a sense of different kinds of characters that can be in horror, different from what um, I think, uh, you know, sometimes in the classic books I was, I was seeing. But that's, uh, that was my introduction. No, I was gonna say, I mean, for me, it's, it's very specific. I went I was a kid, I went to go see uh, Star Trek IV, um, uh, which is the one in San Francisco with the whales. And, uh, I, you know, I had never seen anything, a horror movie before in my life, but I, I thought Star Trek was really cool. And what I didn't know was that there was going to be a trailer for Nightmare on Elm Street, part, I'm trying to think, two, four, three or four at that point. And, um, uh, wasn't prepared, right? It was a girl and she's in her bed and you heard one, two, buckle my shoes, <laughs> the camera's kind of going around. And the glove, you know, the Freddy's glove popped up and um, I just absolutely screamed. I could, it was a, it was a disaster. I, I remember my parents took me out of out of the, the movie, like, are you okay, are you okay? And I experienced, I mean, part of it was the surprise, right? But this moment of feeling like scared to death and this catharsis that kind of came out of this sudden shock of like, what is that thing? I never, I, by the way, I didn't watch Nightmare on Elm Street until many years after that, but um, it's, you know, I went home, I started drawing the glove, right? And I would draw a story about what that meant. I didn't know what Freddy Krueger was. And it sort of set off this uh, lifetime of trying to uh, uh, process that one horrible, <laughs> that one horrible moment that was like really delightful at the same time. And I guess- 84th Street. No, I guess for me, um, 
I was like, I guess I was like an 80s baby, right? So it was like the height of all those movies coming out and sort of watching all those movies. But I, I've had a, I had a real affinity for uh, like Melody, the stories that had the female protagonists, like the Carries and the Rosemary's Babies and all those kind of things. I was like, these, these, these characters are really interesting. Um, and then there's other things going on. I'm also half Jamaican. So the family would sort of sit around and tell what we call duppy stories, like, um, you know, uh, spirits and ghosts are called duppies. And so I was just really interested in hearing those kind of stories. And I guess when I got the opportunity to make those kind of um, films or television, I, I, you know, went for it. That's great. So Tony Todd, I want to go to you first. I was an executive producer on uh, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. And in that documentary, you said at the first screening for Candyman back in the 90s, a colleague said to you, man, you're going to be Candyman forever. And at the time, you might not have, you might have seen that as kind of a troubling idea. I don't know. But I imagine that now you see it as a good thing in terms of your impact on generations of fans. So can you tell us a little bit about how you landed that iconic role and the impact on your career? Well, it definitely was a career changer. You know, I, I, and just to add on to what I said earlier, you know, I was raised an only kid. I was rescued by my aunt. I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, somehow escaped all the all the atrocities of high school and terror. You know, the terror in the hood stuff, gangs, etc. Um, so, me and my aunt, we used to we used to watch the eight o'clock movies every night. That was our learning curve. And no matter, you know, at that time, they were only showing great movies. So with everything from horror to Westerns to adventure to great Billy Wilder stuff. And then she would use it as a talking point with me. Uh, when Candyman came along, she was still alive. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to do the best job I could. Bernard Rose did a brilliant adaptation from Clive Barker's source material, and he he cast me because he saw me a film I did in Africa called The Last Elephant, where I played him a side. And that's the sort of regality he wanted for that role. Um, it hit home when my daughter, Ariana, was three, because initially Candyman wasn't a hit. It took a while to sort of build steam. And we were doing Christmas shopping and uh, people started coming at us, you know, and said, oh, Candyman. And she said, you know, that's not Candyman, that's my dad. So I've never lost that perspective, you know, it, it, the most important role is raising, raising a young one into the world. Uh, I still deal with the fact to, that I once played Candyman and people still come up and I'm, I'm appreciative, but it also opens other avenues because I'm doing a lot of teaching now and writing and doing other roles, working for other people. Some of you have already, already have hired me. So, you know, it's a, it's a thin age sword because when you realize that there are very few people in this particular color of color um, in this in this in this marketplace, and you just want to be truthful and uh, and be honest. So. That's great. <laughs> I love that. Now, Rusty, you were in the middle of Black Horror's last Renaissance in the 1990s, and now we're in the midst of one today. Do you think this one will sustain with more second and third chances for directors? Because for context, you didn't get a chance to do Tales two and three until post Get Out which was more than 20 years after the first Tales from the Hood. So it didn't really, you know, that movement kind of receded. What do you, what do you think of today? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to uh, move forward further than it did, I guess, if you, if you want to call that a renaissance back then. Um, I, I think it's going to sustain, um, you know, it's interesting when I, I'm not just horror, but just when I look at black artists in general, be it um, uh, on the directing side, the writing side, producing, however you want to look at it, it, it there's, all, there's always a benefit to those who come behind someone. So there were people in front of me, directors that I, that I know, like, you know, Charles Burnett and people that you don't know, um, that you've never heard of, that if they were alive or if they were young in today's marketplace, they'd be household names. And so there's, there's always this kind of uh, thing where there's, a, there's a, an engine 
that, that and you, you hope that that keeps rolling, uh, that, that that keeps rolling along. I mean, we had, for example, Rosalind Cash, who was one of the actresses that was in the first Tales from the Hood. When I cast her, she was, I'm nervous because I have Rosalind Cash. She's nervous because she hasn't worked in years, which was a terrible travesty. The woman was brilliant. Um, when I cast Clarence Williams III, he hadn't done a lot. And, you know, it, it'd been spotty. And so when I look at where we are today and I see so many, you know, new young black actors and actresses coming up, uh, writing talent, directing talent, producing talent, it's, it's, uh, it's really cool to see. And you hope that this pushes forward. And I, and I think it will now. I think it's up to the creators and the performers to create work that will sustain and, and push it forward. Um, you know, similar to, uh, uh, I don't know, was it was Tony who was saying this about Candyman? Yeah, that, you know, Tales from the Hood, it didn't jump, it, it didn't jump right to the top of the box office. We had uh, because of the social commentary in the film, the the studio refused to market it the way we felt it should be marketed. If you look at an old trailer for the first Tales from the Hood, you don't know what the F is going on. It's just a bunch of stuff happening because one, it's an anthology. So people are running around and screaming and crazy, but you can't tell that there's anything socially relevant or important because the the studio and, and the marketers felt that it would turn off I don't know white people somebody um, and so the audience in the for tales from the hood has you know just thank God we came along during the VHS age because you wouldn't have known about it it would have been a small thing that a few people kind of heard about so uh, so where we are today yeah I I think. I think it could go on forever as long as the stories being told uh, keep capturing the interests of the audience. That's great. I certainly hope you're right about that. Nicole, I'm going to direct this to you as an actress, but anyone else can also jump in. What would you say is the best training for actors who want to do horror film and television? Um, because it's such a deep well of emotion. What kind of training is best suited for horror and and how do you prepare for those kinds of roles what yeah <laughs> i guess she got the hard um, one i know i'm like what <laughs> tell everyone on sag what kind of training you give us a primer like one through ten no <laughs> I, don't, I don't know like honestly i feel like each situation calls for a different set of skills i think probably a sense of what i mean you know a great sense of imagination facility with the language trusting the script having you know um a relationship with your director and 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 understanding what your character's purpose is but i think i think having a a physical relationship to like your fight or flight or, you know um to like those responses and just making it as, and this is from my point of view, because I tend to be the one that's uh, <laughs> scared. <laughs> I'm not, I like, unlike Tony, I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to be like the bad guy or like the, you know, strong, empowering um, uh, force. So for me, it's, it's about just, you know, um, being in your body, being present and imagining these you know, larger than life circumstances, uh, which, which is what we do. It's just, you really have to have an understanding of what happens to your heartbeat and, you know, the sweat and all, all the stuff and the tears and, you know, um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny though, that you were talking about, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm deviating. <laughs> um, we were talking about like the way that, um, audiences kind of, slowly or, or or like didn't know about uh, Candyman or like Tales from the Hood. And I remember coming up and actually get, having VHSs, having people like passing things around and being like, you have to check this out. And that there was like a moment, I'm even thinking about um, specifically Tales from the Hood and this song from um, 
ghetto boys called um, Minds Playing Tricks on me. And there's like a way that like we do it that like no one else can do it. So that's why it's so necessary for us to tell these stories too, because the cultural context, um, there's like so much in our lives and, and just the history and the potential future that is just so much to be mined uh, that's, you know, frightening. And that's like cortisol inducing constantly. <laughs> so that's my. That is so true. I was watching something, uh, a classic movie. Oh my, Psycho, like where she's driving and she's afraid the police are following her. And that's supposed to be a big dramatic moment. I'm like, listen, that's just getting home from the store on a Tuesday. <laughs> right. But okay. Um, when, Rosa? Oh, so jump in, Melody. No, I just want to jump in because first of all, my my grandmother, my mother knew um, Rosalind Cash and Clarence Williams the Third really well, and um, they there was an acting program at the Y when my grandmother and my my mother were around, and um, and th that was some serious, wonderful acting and and a wonderful place for those actors to have a home in a world that wasn't giving them homes. So. Um, and I started out actually as an actor and um, I trained in in New York. I did this RADA program. I asked, actually, Juilliard did this, this summer program as well. So I was going to throw in there that mask work because a lot of the better theater programs do mask work. And I know Juilliard does as well because so many roles um, in horror um, use practical um, special effects. And so you'll have these these actors that have to emote and and create a character beyond the mask and beyond the makeup that they often send, spend, of course, hours and hours in the chair to, to put on. So so um, I know that the things that I write, um, something that I wrote for the I was in the HBO writers writers program. And, you know, these there's quite a few characters that are going to be in heavy makeup. And so the ability to work through mask work in, in training, I think would be really helpful for horror actors. Great tip. Thank you for that. Um, hey, can I throw something in? Tonight? Yes. yes. Um, just because uh, Melody said that about mask work and she mentioned Clarence. If anyone's seen Tales from the Hood, the scene where he starts to turn into the devil, he has this big speech where he says, this ain't no terror dome and it ain't to this and it ain't that. Welcome to hell, that whole thing. So when we shot that, uh, the linear uh, editing had just kind of come out. We had like, you know, an avid. And all, everything I'd done before that had been on a flatbed. The studio had come down to the set where we were shooting, and they're like, can we see something? And I said, well, I'm going to show you some Clarence's work from yesterday um, that was in the computer. So we put this up, and he starts doing this. This ain't no good. And they're their eyes are popping out of their head. They're like, oh my God, when did you put in special effects? And we're like, there are no special effects. Clarence is just kicking this shit in the ass <laughs> by himself. <laughs> it was like the the everything he was doing was just so amazing. He was he was such an amazing actor. Anyhow, oh that's it. I'm I'm done. Oh, that's great. I love all these, these the synergy with the, the conversation here. When I was just going to ask you to talk a little bit about how you became involved with Monkey Paw, which really has a, a mission, you know, in terms of changing the narrative and the industry. And also, what is Monkey Paw's relationship with actors? What are you looking for with new talent? So I, I'll answer the second part first, um, which is to say, I think... Um, truth, emotional truth in performance. I mean, I think it's very obviously tricky, you know, hard for any, um, you know, and any actor to go to it on audition and, and, you know, try to, you're trying to guess tone, right? You're trying to guess, you know, how does this, the rest of the script fit together with what I'm doing? I think for, for us and, and, you know, this has been something that's always been, you know, key to, um, uh, to, to how we make, an outlandish story play is by really grounded performance. And that it doesn't mean you can't be a crazy person. It doesn't mean you can't be a, uh, a tortured or a sadist or a demon. You could be any of those things. But I think um, by trying to find the truth in it for that character is uh, the best piece of advice I would give to somebody auditioning for Monkey Paw. And, you know, it's a lot, it's, a, it becomes a lot of that. It's just what's, what's, would you, would you really act like that in that 
situation. And, you know, I don't, I think, you know, I, I, I know I speak for Jordan here too, but I think just across all of our, all of our stuff, it's like, it's like, that is, um, there's great range in that. There's all kinds of truth, right? There's not just one way to, that doesn't mean play it down. That doesn't mean be monotone. It just means, um, you know, that we can see that person embracing the the language and the situation uh, in a way that feels real to us and, you know, connects us to the character in an authentic way. Um, no, so that's, and, you know, that's exciting. And um, in terms of the first question, it's a long story. I mean, Jordan and I have been uh, friends since we were 14 years old. Um, we were horror nuts uh, growing up in New York together. Um, the, uh, you know, when Jordan sort of felt like I was already, you know, uh, d doing a lot of producing and, and, uh, a variety of different things and some writing and, and Jordan at the time was, you know, pretty sure that he had, at least for the time being was kind of setting aside the, um, the acting and performing part of, of his career for at least for the time being. And, and, um, you know, I had always, because I've known him for so long, I always thought of him as sort of a horror guy, not a comedy guy, just who happened to be doing comedy. And, um, and so, you know, we, we, we'd been talking about monkey paw as a concept for, you know, a very, 10 years, 15 years, something like that. And, um, and uh, it felt like this was the opportunity and the time to really build what we felt was a necessary company and that there was a, a real hole in the uh, social discourse. Um, certainly there was, and there is a lot of, you know, rhetoric and some of it, I think really, you know, earnest and coming from a, the right place about representation and diversity and, and, you know, every bit counts. But I think for us, it was about um, really making that the engine. And that the idea is that if we could, um, if we could be, if we could, if we had the uh, now the opportunity to be at least in some capacity a gatekeeper, then it was our responsibility to um, uh, to really find new voices um, who uh, weren't just the same, you know, twelve white guys uh, over and over again. And 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 I think the the beauty of that is that. Um, the range of stories and points of view, um, uh, it opens it opens the industry up, I think, in a really rich way. And I, I'm really grateful, um, you know, to have been, been introduced to all of these incredible artists along the way. Well, you know, I, um, I think, in fact, I know for a fact, Monkey Paw has had a huge impact on Black horror, horror period, really. So kudos to you all and Melody you're one of the creators helping to shape the future of black horror, sort of waiting in the wings there. What's the most encouraging to you about this moment? And do you think that there are pitfalls that black horror creators should avoid? Ooh. I know um, I gave you a tough one too. Um, well, I, I like Randy, I, I see there, there's a special moment now that's different than in the past because in the past, I think we had black creatives in front of the camera. And now we have this moment where we're in front of the camera, we're also behind the camera. So we have, you know, a friend of mine, um, Sibel Martin, is a black woman who's a DP. We have Ava, we have Macro, we, you know, we, ha we have um, you know, Indian Meadows. We have all these creatives who are producing and directing. And most importantly, from my perspective, and I, and I, direct and I and I started out as an actor but the writing is that's the beginning that's the that's the germ that's the seed and I just see there's just a wealth of of black writers in general let alone in horror that are starting to come up so I've had I've been in generals where people have said you know we don't they're in, you're such a unicorn you're so a black woman who writes horror I'm like no <laughs> there are a lot of us out here and we you know we're out here and we're doing it you just don't know that we're here so I think that there's a, um, a better sense of, of who is out here to tell these stories and, and tell these incredible stories um, that have gone unheard. And, and part of telling, tell, part of black horror isn't just telling horror that has black people in it, 
because that, that's what I write and but I also write stories that have different kinds of people, different marginalized people. Um, and we should be able to tell a variety of stories and it's black horror because we're telling it. And so I think that there's a, a, a just a growing sense of you know what black horror means. Um, one of the things for me personally that I try to avoid is, um, and this has come up a lot, uh, is re-traumatizing the black community in particular with the kind of horror that we address and, the, and, and really the way in which we address the horror. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that really worked for me when I saw the new Candyman was the way in which Nia and, um, uh, used shadow puppetry. And it was a brilliant way of addressing the trauma that we've been through historically, that we are still going through, without depicting it too graphically in a way that for those of us who, and most of us haven't, you know, unfortunately, in some way, shape or form, have been traumatized by either watching videos of George Floyd or personally going through issues um, with whether it's with police or or just the general society. Um, it I think there are, there are really important um, ways in which we can address all of this and we can depict it, but we have to be very careful about how we do it. And I think that that goes for almost almost anything. It, it, it goes also for I mean I worked on Law and Order SVU. Um, most, a lot of the viewers are um, survivors and we're very careful about how we depict what, and you know, we're also network television, so we can only show so much. But I, I think it's really important to, to think about that, um, especially for black horror, because there's a moment for us. And I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have, um, we have an impact on our audience. I knew you'd hit that out of the park, Melody. Uh, <laughs> we've talked about this many times, but also this is one for just everyone. Anyone jump in uh, whenever you like. You know, when you start out in your career, you have an image of what success is. And then as your career progresses, you kind of shift your relationship to what you think success is or it wasn't what you thought it would be. So I'm just wondering how your definition of success has changed in the course of your career and why? Well, for me, I, I, I just want to, I made a decision to return to, uh, to, to doing more theater. Um, as you said, with the King Headley thing, I was had the privilege this summer of doing August Wilson's one man show, How I Learned What I Learned at the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival. It was wonderful. It was cathartic. It was one of the first theaters to reopen after this crazy two year period of isolation and Zoom conversations. And, I, I, you know, and I, I like what everybody's talking about you know, just being true to whatever whatever is presented to you. Um, you know, we as African-Americans have a rich history of, uh, you know, underutilization and tragedies and stuff that, that is, you know, that pain is easily accessible to us. And just finding the right places to do that. And hopefully everybody gets to eat, you know, like the African villages, we have one chicken, everybody gets to put something on the plate. And and I'm so happy to witness, because I can remember arriving in Hollywood and being the only person of color on the set, whether in the cast or the crew. And there's like, what, a hundred different crew positions? And I used to wonder, how come there's not more of us at this party? And now finally, of all the um, filming recent renaissance in Atlanta, you, you've seen the the, the scales tip a little bit in a, in a great way. So as long as you're tipping, we need to be ready when we step up to the plate and knock that damn ball out of the park. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Who else wants to jump in? I guess I'll go since I'm old. And <laughs> generally, as you get old, this is when you start to readjust and things. Everybody else looks too young. Even Tony looks too young. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, I think, um, for me, it, it's, you know, so I, well, I started out on the performing side, I did stand up and I was an actor, I was on a soap opera, I, I, I came from that side. And then somewhere after doing Hollywood Shuffle and um, school days with Spike as an actor, I started to see the value of, of writing. Um, and part of that was you know, during that time period, being an actor, there were certain types of roles that I would always have to go out on because it was a very limited 
uh, limited number of things that you could do. So I, in fact, I used to have a joke in my stand up where I'd say, yeah, I went to this audition and I did this role and they, and I said, Hey man, uh, give me your money. Cause <laughs> it's always try to be, I'm sticking up somebody. I was gang members and all that shit. So I say, give me your money. And they'd go, Hey, can you, can you do it more ethnic? And I'd go, but can you give me your money? <laughs> and they would get this off. But anyway, <laughs> they didn't say what kind of ethnic. Wow. Right. Um, no, so, <laughs> so, but that was, that was what was happening. And so as an actor uh, and initially coming in as a stand up, you know, the, the, the success thing was fame, perhaps it was money. And I had, I had a five minutes of fame on, on, a, on a soap operas in the, what was it? Early nineties or late eighties, whatever the hell it was. All you had to be on was for like two or three days and you could walk down Hollywood Boulevard and everyone would point at you. So I kind of felt that, but I didn't like being on the soap. I didn't like the soap opera. Um, I didn't find it nourishing as, as an artistic thing. There was nothing going on, uh, you know, who's doing what to whom every day and who's going to kill them. That's soap operas all the way around. So um, working with Spike and then Robert and actually one of the other actors on the show who would sneak into his dressing room and type all the time. And I'm like, what are you doing in there? He was an older guy. He's like, ah, I write. I can't. This is, this is nothing, but I write. And so I started to to write. And. I guess how my perception of success changed through all of that was now what I value about my work and, and, you know, my career such as it's been is the fact that I've done certain things that people really respond to and they look back on. I'm shocked sometimes that people still talk about fear of black hat or tales from the hood and the way that they talk about it. And to me, that is the success, creating art, creating something that lives on in a way. It's, you know, whereas probably if you talk to me as a 20 year old, I would have been, well, you know, a house, a, a bigger car, more money. Hey, all the women love me. All of that stuff that you think about, <laughs> a lot of people still do. But you start to realize if, if you're an artist, what you want is for your art to have impact, to to to, um, you know, maybe change minds here and there. You know, the, the greatest thing that's happened to me ever in uh, response to my work is I've had gang members come up to me and say that they stopped gang banging because of Tales from the Hood. I've had women, uh, a couple of women who ran a uh, shelter for abused women. Uh, and children come up and talked about the episode with David Allen Greer um, where he was beating Paul J. Parker and, it, and, and that whole thing. And it was dealing with um, domestic abuse. And I had always been worried that it was a flippant way to deal with it because no one can kill their, um, you know, kill their monster by balling them up in a ball the way we did in the thing. But she said, no, it's uh, it's cathartic for women and children who have gone through this. And it's kind of interesting that Melody says that SUV has all these viewers that potentially have gone through some kind of trauma. And I, I think that people do get a cathartic, can have a cathartic relationship to film and definitely can have a cathartic relationship to horror movies uh, where you, are, or you create this monster that they can then see be destroyed. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's also is a very mirror image of, you know, way, the way life is in that the things that scare you, the people that scare you, the situations that scare you, those are your monsters. So when you go to a horror movie, you are supplanting how you deal with monsters in real life and you're putting it on this thing, be it Frankenstein, be it Swamp Thing or be it Candyman or whatever that is. So now it's up there and it's on that and you're dealing with it in that way. So success, uh, hey, uh, you are actually talking to me about some stuff that I made 20 years ago. That's success. <laughs> I, I, I have one thing to say for actors, because for me, things are new 
for me in TV and film, but having, um, for me, creating opportunity for actors. Um, it started out being kind of selfish because in New York, I didn't find there were strong enough roles for black actresses. So I wrote a play um, that ended up being produced in several cities. And then when I realized, oh, I wrote something that other actors can work in, that was very gratifying then to see their work. It didn't have to be me in it. Um, and then when I had a play developed at New York Stage and Film, to see that there was someone who said, you know, you should think about TV and film. And now I'm able to, I'm, I'm writing a feature for Netflix. I just came out of the Sundance Episodic Lab and I'm able to write these black characters and create work that's outside of the box and different than what we've usually seen for for black actors and tv really interests me because that's a lot of work for a lot of people that that can be created for in just one season even in just a pilot episode i mean the episode i wrote for sbu there were four black actresses in it who had a chance to really get into it um in an episode about missing black women and so the idea idea of creating opportunity for actors who in, in the kinds of roles that we haven't often seen ourselves, doctors, scientists, um, you know, all kinds, a range of roles, you know, a, a mother from, you know, a, a mother, a single mother of three who's just trying to get out of the hole. And in all the, these kind of real life, authentic characters, um, to be able to create, the, create that for me, that's success. That's, um, it makes me ecstatically happy. <laughs> But what is success? When I'm thinking about you, Nicole, I'm wondering like what does success maybe mean to you? I can rephrase it slightly because when Miss Juneteenth came out, a whole lot of buzz and people were like, oh my gosh, and we're like, well, we've been new about Nicole Bahari. <laughs> you know, we've been watching Nicole Bahari for years. What is what is success for you? I don't know. I think Rusty um, said it really well when he said that people feel something and they, they get something from whatever you've created. I mean, everyone here, they're the like creators. I've been sort of um, like, the, like the, the, the translator, you know? So it's for someone to, to sort of see something that I've been in and really relate to a moment or some aspect of the character or the character's um, relationships uh, and to like take the time to reach out or like you said, for things to um, trend and all that kind of stuff is is uh, beyond what I had ever imagined. I'm, I do it because I love it. I do it because I love the stories. If I get the opportunity to work with wonderful people, um, you know, I take it. I think for me, that's, that's kind of it, being able to do what I genuinely love with my life. I'm pretty simple pretty simple person. I don't, I don't require, you know, I, I like he was saying houses and cars and all that stuff. It's really, I get a lot out of this, out of doing this. And I, I come from the theater. Um, so I thought I was going to be just doing that, you know, so I get to sort of do a little bit of everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge blessing. Yeah. And I, the great, thank you, Nicole. And when and I think I like to be on a panel with these people, like, I mean, this right? is, like yeah, all of these moments. I think this is, yeah, it's it's very it's very um, it's it's very powerful. <laughs> this is a powerful panel. You are very powerful. Uh, and 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 when I guess we'll we'll end it with with your response. You can either speak personally or maybe on behalf of Monkey Paw. What does success look like, or how has your definition of it changed? I think for us, the that success means widening the aperture for understanding that there's, I mean, to Melody's point before, it's not like we started this company and then struggled to find a great script from a person of color. There are so many of them. There's so many incredible artists out there that, that have so many incredible viewpoints and um, make, uh, uh, and, and that for us, if we can look back on Monkey Pond 20 years from now and be like, oh, we've just expanded to some extent the um how people look at horror and fantasy and science fiction and thrillers and to look at genre storytelling as just a 
just a much, much, much wider pool than the way that they've, that, that Hollywood has traditionally treated it. Um, I mean, that would just be the most incredible, uh, in incredible blessing of all. And we're, we're not there yet at all, but um, that is, that's where I, that's where I really hope that we can get is to, is to really help be some small part of, of changing that conversation and, and, and making studios and networks realize that like, those aren't, it's not risky. It's not, not relatable. It's not niche. It's like human condition shit. Pardon. Sorry. I cursed on SAG Afra. Is that okay. Uh, it's human. It's human. It's human. It's probably okay. It's, 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 it's about the human condition and that um, a genre and horror is uh, a, a lot bigger um, than we've given it credit for. Well, that is fantastic. And we don't have to wait 20 years, although imagine 20 years from now, but just in a couple years, the changes I've seen have been incredible. So thank you to all of you. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I really want to thank all of you for sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performers and with our audience. This has been such a thrill for me. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Janet Reed. And Janet Reed, when, when do you do the podcast or the, the thing where people interview you? <laughs> Cause, Cause you're, now. You're, you're, your achievements are off the chain. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm just blessed to still be here, Rusty. I think you know how I feel. I'm just glad I lived to see it. That's all okay, I can say. Okay. All um, right. <laughs> if, if anybody watching this that doesn't know who this woman is, you better get on, <laughs> stick her name in your Google. Well, I appreciate it. It is my honor and pleasure to share this space, both on the Zoom and in just in the planet with all of you. So keep doing what you do. Um, always looking forward to what's next. And thank you to SAG-AFTRA for putting us all together so we can visit. Thank you.